Good morning, Station Hill. It's great to see y'all. I missed being with you last week, but was also so encouraged by Taylor's sermon out of 2 Samuel 7. He served us so well. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we also want to extend an especially warm welcome to you. It's very thankful that you would take this time on your beautiful Sunday morning to be here with us. And it's my prayer that you are deeply encouraged, not only by the songs that we've been singing already, but, but by what God has to say to us in his word together this morning. I want to go ahead and invite you to open in your Bibles to Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 23, Psalm 23. If you're using the Bible we provided, you'll find the passage on page 483. Those Bibles are underneath the seats in front of you. And if you're not familiar with navigating the Bible, you'll find Psalm 23 is the big, bold number 23 on page 483. We're going to be looking all of that Psalm this morning. We're continuing our series that is going to take us through the entire Bible this year. And today is a bit of a milestone in that series as it's the first Psalm that we're studying in this sermon series. Since we're trying to cover the whole Bible this year, we're hitting the major passages along the way that help us to understand the gospel and God's plan of redemption as it's revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. And if you're at all familiar with the Bible, I'm guessing that the fact that we're covering Psalm 23 in our sermon series is a surprise to absolutely nobody, right? Of the 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms, there is no Psalm that is more well known or beloved than Psalm 23. In fact, it's quite possible that Psalm 23 is the most popular piece of poetry that has ever been written in all of human history. Christians and even non-Christians alike love what it has to say about God being our shepherd. And we're going we're gonna to consider a lot about what that means for God to be our shepherd this morning. And it's as profound as it is popular, right? If you've never heard or read Psalm 23 before, it's no exaggeration for me to say that this psalm has the power to change your life. But its power isn't just for those who haven't heard it before. If you're hearing it today as a Christian for the hundredth time or the thousandth time, right? The more you hear and internalize the message of Psalm 23, the more that you're going to begin to notice things like contentment and courage and confident hope in your eternal destiny saturating all that you do and experience in life. It's a psalm that we really need to hear and listen to over and over again. It's timeless truths are that important for us. And perhaps you joined us at the women's event just a, a couple weeks ago where my wife Leah spoke on Psalm 23. So you're going to get to hear Psalm 23 again this morning. And I promise I am not plagiarizing her talk as good as I heard that it was. But, but it's, it's so important for us to hear this type of Psalm and God's word over and over again because we have so much to learn from it. And we're going to hear it again now as I read it for us. So I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. You can follow along in your Bible or on the screen behind me as I read it. Uh, this is God's word. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, this, this psalm may be well known by so many of us. 
We pray, though, that by your spirit, you would give us fresh ears, fresh eyes to hear its amazing, its comforting, and its encouraging truths in a new way. Would you show us, Father, how you are our good shepherd and that the Lord Jesus is shepherding his people right now by the spirit. And would you teach us from Psalm 23 how you provide, protect, and pursue your people. And we pray that you would do this for our good and for your glory. And we pray this all in the matchless name of our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Friends, you can go ahead and be seated. If you're taking notes, the main point of Psalm 23 is that God, our shepherd, provides for us, protects us, and pursues us all the days of our lives. God, our shepherd, provides for us, protects us, and pursues us all the days of our lives. And those Three P's are actually going to be the three points of our, my sermon this morning. Point one, God provides. Point two, God protects. And point three, God pursues. So first, let's take a look at the passage. We'll see that God provides in point one. Look at me again at verse one. David says there, the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. Uh, Other translations famously say, I shall not want. David's saying that because the Lord is his shepherd, he lacks nothing. God has provided for all of his needs. And I want you to notice how abundant God's provision was. Look at verse two. God lets him lie down in green pastures. The image that comes to mind is of a shepherd bringing his sheep to rolling lush green hills to to feed on its grass. The image is of a lush meadow, serene, peaceful, and full of abundant nourishment. But it's not only a place to be fed, it's also a place of deep Rest. Notice what he says there. It's a place to to find shelter. He makes me lie down in green pastures, other translations say. It's a place to find shelter and rest from the storm, completely protected by the all-powerful shepherd from any lurking dangers. And yet we see God provides even more. Look at verse two again. He leads me beside quiet waters. These are waters of rest and refreshment, right? God's God's people drink from the peaceful, life-giving waters that produce rest for their souls. More than that, God provides renewed strength for David. Look at verse three. He renews or restores his life and then guides David in the right path, always leading him in the path that would serve him best. God provided all that David needed, and as a result, David lacked nothing. We need to think about this against the backdrop of what we know about David's life, right? Most of the Psalms written by David in book one of the Psalter, of which Psalm 23 is a part, are about times in his life that he was under duress and being attacked, fleeing from persecution and opposition. And most commentators think Psalm 23 was written during one of these periods. So, the, so these green pastures, this, these quiet waters are, are, are work that God is doing in his life in ways that he's providing for him in the midst of all of the difficulty he was facing. And yet through all of the hardship, The hardship of running for his life from King Saul in the mountains and wilderness or or being under attack from the enemy nations around him. David tangibly experienced God providing for all of his needs. And if you've been tracking with the Bible reading plan, then, then you've actually seen God do this throughout the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. If we read the accounts of David's life, we see tangible expressions of God providing for David's needs. We see how God provided shelter for David, both in the cave of Adullam as he was running in the mountains and wilderness from Psalm, and also in the palace of an enemy king. We saw God provide food for David 
while he was on the run from Ahimelech through Ahimelech, the priest, and we saw him provide food through Abigail, right, when David was in need. God provided for David time and time again. And friends, I hope you see that God continues to provide for all that his people need. So that we should all who have trusted in Jesus Christ, we should all be able to say with David right now in this moment, I lack nothing. I wonder, can you say that with David today? Are you saying that with David this morning? Do you have an awareness of how abundantly God has provided for you? Uh, If not, which it's common to not always have that awareness. I don't know about you, but I, I often wake up grumpy in the morning, focused more on what God hasn't done for me and what I don't have than what on, I, what, uh, on what I do have. If, if not, if you're not able to say that today, though you've trusted in Jesus Christ, it may be because you're not paying careful attention to what David is saying here. I want you to look again at verse one. Notice what he says there. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I have all that I want or all that I desire or all that I expect in the timing that I expect. No, he says, I have all that I need. I think sometimes when we're struggling with discontentment, it's because we're more focused on what we don't have that we want rather than on what we do have that we actually need and which God has abundantly provided for us. Oh, friends, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that if you took careful inventory of your life today, you would be able to say with David, I have all that I need. Right, think about how God has provided abundantly for our physical needs by providing food and water and shelter, and clothing, and so many other needs. And though we take so many of these things for granted, these provisions from God for our material and physical needs, we should never fail to be astounded by this. I don't know how many of you are like me, but I, I sit down for breakfast, and I sit down for lunch, or I sit down for dinner, and I just, I just rattle off a quick mindless prayer. Lord, thank you for this food. I appreciate it. Pray that you would bless it to my body. In Jesus' name, amen. And right, it's a good thing for me to be praying that, but I often am discouraged with my own self because I'm, I'm sitting down and not realizing just how astounding it is that the Lord of the universe would provide me a meal. Do you ever think about how astounding that reality is? Just think about what David is saying. He's saying, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God who is slow to anger, who maintains love to thousands and who forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The God who created everything, who spoke everything into existence, the one who dwells in unapproachable light, the one who sits enthroned among the cherubim, surrounded by angels who cry, holy, 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 that Lord God Almighty is also your shepherd. Did that ever astound you? That reality astound you? God has chosen from on high to come down and be your shepherd? Being a shepherd's not a white collar job, right? It's not like God is coming down. He's like, I'm coming to rule the universe and you, you must follow me. He's coming down and saying, no, no, I am, I'm gonna walk alongside of you and I am going to be your shepherd. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get dirty with you. I'm gonna get into the mess with you. I am going to be your personal shepherd. Friends, that should astound us. That the, the great sovereign God of the universe troubles himself with you and me to provide for us, to nourish us, to keep us on the right path and provide for all that we need. But it's more than just our physical needs that God provides for. He also provides abundantly for our spiritual needs. And we see that clearly in the text. Look again at verse three. It says, He renews my life. Other translations say, he restores my soul. He's he's working in my inner being to renew me and strengthen me and restore me. The word for renew here is the same word for repent 
or turn around. The idea that David is trying to communicate here, he's, he's, he's trying to say, look, listen, I am prone to wander. I am prone to leave the God I love, which you've, if you've read about David's life, then you know he is prone to wander, right? But God, in his mercy, pursued David. He took his shepherd's staff and his crook and he rescued him. He said, yeah, you're wandering away from me and I'm, I'm just gonna grab you with my shepherd's staff and bring you right back into this right path where you were meaning to be, where you need to be. God, in his mercy, pursues David after he's wandering and restores him. He, he turns him around. He renews his soul. He puts him back on paths of righteousness. And friends, we, we are no different from David. We're no different from David, right? We are also prone to wander. We're also prone to leave the God we love. Yet God has given us his word to shepherd us. He gives us his living and active word to convict, to challenge, to comfort, to confront, and to call us back into the right path. More than his word, God even has given us this weekly gathering, this time for the church to come together, to to worship the Lord Almighty in all of his power and strength. And God has given us this weekly gathering where we come to worship as one of the primary ways that he has determined to shepherd his flock, to provide for us spiritually, to renew our souls and to lead us in paths of righteousness. When we come in here each Sunday to gather to worship the Lord, God is bringing us again into green pastures. He's saying, he's saying hey, lie, you can lie down here. This is a place for you to be nourished by my word and, and built up. It's a place for you to drink deeply of the rivers of the water of life that flow from my son, Jesus Christ. This is a place for me to, to speak to you by my word and to, to, to perhaps confront you you, you hear God's word. I don't know how many times in your life you've come to, to church on a Sunday and you've heard a sermon and you've heard what God has to say to you and you think, oh my gosh, I'm not actually doing what God has said. I, I'm actually going in the wrong path. I, I'm wandering out of God's way. And what, what is God doing in that moment? He's taking his shepherd's staff and he's saying, hey, come back in here. Come back to this path. I'm gonna renew you. I'm gonna restore you. Right, that, that's what he's doing in this guy. Think of what we've already done this morning. Think of the songs that we've sung already this morning. I, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. We're, we're reminding ourselves of all of the ways that we've called upon God in the past years of our lives and we've seen him provide for us time and time again. We, we sang in Christ alone, right? Talking about the solid rock of Jesus Christ, reminding ourselves that there is no other solid foundation for us to build our lives upon, right? It's in here that God brings us into these green pastures to personally shepherd us, to nourish our souls, to, to feed us with his word, to feed us with his truth, to come alongside of us as our shepherd and to restore our souls. I, I bring that up because I just want to emphasize how important it is for us to regularly gather for worship each Sunday with the church. Right, this is, this is a, the green pastures, right, of nourishment and quiet waters. As we hear God's word preached, God reveals ways that we're wandering from his path and uses his word to call us back into his ways. And this is why I want to encourage you to think long and hard about commitments you have in your life, whether it's things like work commitments or sporting event commitments with kids. We know those happen a lot. But I want you to think long and hard about those commitments that are going to result in you regularly missing church on Sundays. God says that wherever two or three are gathered, he's talking about the, the context of the gathering of the local church, wherever two or three are gathered, there he is with them. He's talking about his presence in the gathering, his personal presence as our shepherd to lead and guide us as we walk through this life. Right, more important than work events or sporting events is God's people hearing from our good shepherd in the midst of the gathering on a weekly basis. Now listen, I, I want to be very clear. I am not saying you should never miss church. But I, what I want to encourage you to think about developing in your life is a pattern in which you're regularly attending church if you're in town and you're not sick. I think this is especially important for the teens whether you're following Jesus now, you're thinking about following him, maybe you are following him now, I want to encourage you to, to set a pattern in your life now that when the church gathers, you're going to be there 
Because you know when you come together with the the rest of God's flock, the good shepherd is going to be there with you, leading you, guiding you, feeding you, nourishing you, right? But it's not just how he provides here. I want you to think about all the other ways that God has provided for us in Jesus. What, What does the New Testament tell us that God has done? He has adopted us as his children. He has cleansed us from sin. He has forgiven us of all our iniquity. Our sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west. He has justified us for all eternity, declared innocent once and for all. He has seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. Right now, you and I are spiritually seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And Paul says in Ephesians, he has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not one, not some, but every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Friends, you and I can say in this moment, the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. God provides for his people. And that brings us to point two, God protects his people. People. Look with me at the first line of verse four. David describes journeying through the darkest valley. Right? Other translations famously describe it as the valley of the shadow of death. In Hebrew, they're both legitimate translations. In David's culture, for shepherds to get their sheep from where they were to the pastures and water meant they had to often cross treacherous terrain, right? Which included things like dark and dangerous valleys and those deep and dark valleys were also home to things like wild animals, lions, bears, or lurking attackers, people who wanted to rob, steal, and kill. And David's using the image of a dark and dangerous valley to describe the world. Right, to describe what it's like just living in the world. Living in the world is like living in the valley of the shadow of death. I think he's not exaggerating, right? Think about the threats that he faced. He lived on the run in the wilderness for a long period of his life. The king of Israel was continually hunting him down to try and kill him. During his own reign as king, he was constantly going to war. He experienced terrible dysfunction in his own family. His own son wanted to kill him, right? David's entire life was lived in the valley of the shadow of death. I wonder how many of you can relate to David and can relate to his experience. I wonder how many of you feel like your whole life has been lived in the valley of the shadow of death. Like life has just been one trial after another. Maybe you grew up in a broken and dysfunctional home. And then later on in life, you, you got into the college that you wanted to go to. Yes, but, but then college didn't pan out the way that you thought it would. You got married. You want, really wanted to get married. Yes, but, but then you struggled with infertility. You, you got the job that you loved, but then you lost it. You, you took care of your body, you worked out, it took supplements and ate well, but then you got a life-altering diagnosis. Maybe that isn't your life. Maybe your life has largely been free from trials, but you still feel like you're living in the valley of the shadow of death because you, you look at the world around you and you just see wars, rumors of more wars. Is there gonna be World War III? There's rumors of more pandemics, the threat of economic collapse, the division in our country, increasing division in our country, right? It just feels like, gosh, am I I living in the valley, the shadow of death? The natural response to living in the valley of the shadow of death is to be afraid, right? To be afraid of all the bad things that can happen to us. But one of the startling and great truths of Psalm 23 is that you don't need to fear the terrors of this world because you and I are not traveling through this valley alone as helpless sheep, but we are personally guided by the personal and powerful presence of God Almighty. That's why David says, even though I walk through the valley, I will not fear. Why? Because you, the Lord, The maker of heaven and earth are with me. (laughs) You are with me in this valley. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
The shepherd's rod and shepherd's staff would be used as weapons to defend against robbers or wild animals that lurked in these dark and dangerous valleys. And so David is saying, you know, God, God, is, God is with him. God is bringing him, this is bringing him comfort to David because he knows that no matter what awaits him in the valley, in the dark valleys, that the God of all power would powerfully protect him in the midst of whatever he faced. And we can have that same confidence today, friends. Because if we've trusted in Jesus Christ, God has become our shepherd and he is with us. Think about what he said to his disciples as he sent them out at the end of Matthew's gospel to venture into the valley of the shadow of death where they would face opposition, where they would face persecution, where they would face trial after trial and perils unlike any other before. When Jesus sent them out two by two, what did he say to them? Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Throughout history, God's people have known that as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that the powerful Lord Almighty is with them in the darkness. And that has enabled them to face even the darkest and scariest events in life with courageous faith. The good shepherd has always and will always be personally present with his sheep. And he's personally present with you today if you have put your faith in him. And knowing that Jesus is personally present with us has the power to drive out fear as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Friends, I wonder what valley are you walking through today? What's your valley of the shadow of death today? Maybe your valley is unemployment, job loss. You just keep putting in applications and you just can't get the job that you want. And maybe your valley is sickness, disease. It's just taking hold of your body. And maybe your valley is loneliness. You just want a companion to the world, just, just extremely lonely. Maybe your valley is grief and pain that just you have no words for. If that's you, or there are other valleys that you're in today, hear what God is saying to you from Psalm 23. Know for certain that while you are in the valley, you are not alone. God himself is with you. In the midst of the darkest valleys, God himself is with you, carefully shepherding you, leading you through the dark valley with his rod and staff ever ready to protect you from ultimate harm. And friends, we, we know on this side of the cross, we know that God is with us because he showed us how far he would go to be personally present with his sheep. Did he not? God, the son, Jesus Christ, left the green pastures of heaven to enter into the valley of the shadow of death. To do what? To come and seek and save the lost, to come and rescue his wandering sheep. But Jesus, friends, didn't just walk in the valley of the shadow of death to save us. He entered into death itself, dying in our place, bearing the judgment we deserve for our sins. Yet after he died, God showed that he has the power to deliver from even death itself by raising Jesus from the dead. And the personal and powerful presence of God that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in each one of you if you have put your trust in the good shepherd. Jesus Christ, by his spirit, preserves us and protects us as we walk by faith in the valley of the shadow of death now. And because of that, we can face the darkest of trials and even death with courageous fear. But listen, when, when David says, I will not fear, he's not saying, I will not feel fear, right? It, it's impossible to not feel fear in the valley of the shadow of death in this world. What he's saying is, I'm not going to be controlled by this fear. I'm going to be controlled by what I know about God. And I know that God is stronger than any of my valleys. He is brighter than any of the darkness I'm facing. He can lift me out of the darkness at any time he pleases. And he is with me. Therefore, I will not be controlled by fear. And at the same time, 
we can acknowledge that if we're walking through a particularly dark valley in life, that we haven't ended up there by chance. Just as God will at times lead us into green pastures and by quiet waters, so he will at times also lead us into dark valleys. I want to highlight this for the teens especially. Notice what David says. He says, when I go through the darkest valley. He doesn't say, if I go through the darkness valley, I, I, I will not. He says, when I go through the darkest valley. When it comes to dark valleys in life, the question isn't if, but when. And I say that to the teens especially because I don't want you to be surprised when you end up in dark valleys over the course of your life. I think sometimes we can think that I've trusted in Jesus, everything's gonna be smooth sailing from here on out. God's just gonna bring me into his kingdom and life is gonna be so easy. But Jesus says it's, it's through many trials and tribulations that we come into his kingdom. He will lead us into dark valleys. It's, it's not a, an expression of God being displeased with you. It's not a sign that God doesn't love you. God just leads us into dark valleys at times because there are things about God and about walking with God that you can only learn in the valley. You can't learn them on the mountaintop. You have to be brought down into the valley at times so that God can show you his power, to show you that he, he, he can be trusted even in the darkest of valleys, to, to prove to you that he is mighty to save, to prove that our God is an awesome God as we've sung this morning and to show us that nothing in all of life can ever or will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, not even death itself. If you were at the women's event a couple of weeks ago, then you heard my wife Leah share one of my favorite illustrations of this. There's a famous pastor named Donald Barnhouse. His wife passed away at an early age. And as he was driving to her funeral with his little children, he stopped at a traffic crossing. And while they were at the traffic crossing ahead of them, there was a, a, a large truck driving down the road. And the sun hit the truck at such an angle that it cast a large shadow over the snowy field beside it. And Barnhouse quickly pointed at the shadow and he said, children, tell me, would you rather be struck by the truck or struck by its shadow? And the, the youngest child very quickly, very obviously said, well, we, we would rather be struck by the shadow because the shadow couldn't hurt anybody. Barnhouse said, that's right, children. And remember, Jesus let the truck of death strike him so that only its shadow will pass over you. Your mother lives with Jesus now. Only the shadow of death has passed over her. Oh, friends, Jesus walked through death itself so that only its shadow would pass over those who've trusted in him. I know some of you are in the valley of the shadow of death now. I know some of you are experiencing this acutely right now. Some of you may be in that valley for the rest of your life as you carry around the grief and pain of losses you've experienced. But if that's you, God wants you to take heart. The shadow is passing. God will one day lead you out of the valley and into his glorious and eternal presence forever. And that brings us to our third and final point. God pursues. I want you to look at me at verse five. David says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I want you to notice how the, how the imagery shifts from God as a shepherd in the first four verses to God as a generous host in the last two verses. Even in the midst of David's trials, even in the midst of his suffering, God is preparing a feast for David, right? He's setting his table with the finest of delicacies, the richest of foods, the sweetest of treats. He anoints David's head with oil, right? 
Not only because David was the anointed king, but this is how you treated the honored guest at a victory feast. Think of Psalm 45, which says, you have anointed me with the oil of gladness. God, the generous host, is filling David's soul with gladness, right? He's pouring out glasses and cups of gladness, and he isn't stopping. David says, my cup overflows. It's like David is sitting at the Lord's table, holding his cup up, and God just takes the bottle of gladness and starts dunking it out into David's cup. And David's like, okay, you know, you can stop. And God's like, no, I'm going to keep pouring and pouring and pouring. The gladness you will experience in my presence will never end. Your cup will overflow. And God's abundant blessing, the generous feast that he holds for David, symbolized the evident and obvious ways that God generously supplied mercy and grace for David for all of his enemies to see. And that was simply an outworking of God pursuing David with his covenant love. Look at verse six. David says, only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. If you know that Shane and Shane song, surely goodness, right? This is where it's coming from, right? Only, sorry, sorry about that. I am not part of the choir. That's why I only come up to preach, right? But I do like to sing loudly in my car, but I keep it in my car, right? But David says, only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. The Hebrew word for faithful love is chesed. This is God's steadfast love. God's steadfast love is his special covenant love for his chosen people. What the Jesus Storybook Bible calls the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love of God. And it's this steadfast love of God that is pursuing David. I don't want you to move too quickly past that word. Other translations say, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, as though it's like this this passive mercy and grace of God that is following David. But David says, his faithful love pursues me. The Hebrew word there could also be translated as chasing. God in his love is literally chasing, pursuing, hunting David down to pour out his abundant blessings on David, even in the midst of his dark valley. But more than that, God is going to chase David out of the valley and into his glorious presence forever. Look at the rest of verse 6. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. David knows that because of God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking always and forever love, that try as he may to wander from God, God in his love won't let David do it. David's like a little sheep just trying to get away, go down every, and God's like, nope, you're coming back. Nope, you're coming back. And I don't know about you, but this is what God is doing for us in the midst of our lives as we journey through the valley of the shadow of death, as we're confronted by the fears of this world, we hold fast to God. And and as we wander from time to time, God is saying, no, I am chasing you down with my covenant love. I will not let you get away because where you want to go is not gonna bless you for eternity. I am gonna grab you and I'm gonna bring you myself into my glorious presence forever. And friends, I hope you see that what was true for David in Psalm 23 is also true for you and true for me, that God has pursued us in his steadfast love, and he is going to bring you into his glorious presence forever. I mean, hasn't, hasn't God pursued us in an even more obvious and amazing way than he pursued David? I mean, think about how God has pursued us. The Lord Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven above to come and seek and save the lost. Jesus is the good shepherd of Psalm 23, the good shepherd who didn't just walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but who walked through death itself so that you and I could have eternal life. He is the one who was led perfectly on paths of righteousness, who lived perfectly for the glory of God, never wandering from God's paths. You see how he trusted in God, even in the valley of the shadow of death, as he went out into the wilderness and he was attacked by Satan, but he knew that God was with him. 
His rod and his staff were guarding him from Satan. He perfectly trusted in God at all times. And the shocking thing about Psalm 23 is that his cup truly did overflow, but it didn't overflow with God's blessing. Jesus Christ on the cross drank deeply of the cup of wrath that you and I deserve so that you and I could receive God's cup of blessing so that we could say of God, our cup overflows. And after he rose from the dead, Jesus walked into the house of the Lord forever. But what does Jesus say to his people? He says, I, the good shepherd of the sheep, am coming back for you. This is what he says in John 14, right? Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's room are me- in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that you may be where I am also. That's the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd of the sheep, the embodiment, the incarnation of God's steadfast love, pursuing and leading his people all the way home is coming back for his people. And when he comes back, he is going to lead us out of the valley of the shadow of death and into his glorious presence forever. And when we arrive in God's house, I I hope you see this from Psalm 23. When we arrive in God's house, God, the generous host, is going to throw a feast that is beyond our wildest imagination. And at that feast, our cups will overflow forever. It's there that we will experience the eternal green pastures, the eternal quiet waters. There we will drink from the river of the water of life, and our souls will be at rest forever. The destination of our journey, friends, is God himself. We will live in his house and in his presence forever. And that's where Jesus is leading us to right now. Think of Revelation chapter 7, verse 17. God's people will no longer hunger nor thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat, for the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, friends, I know some of you are hurting today. Some of you are experiencing acute pain and grief. Some of you are experiencing acute sorrow and tears. I know that right now for some of you, the valley seems impossibly dark. But hear what God is saying to you from Psalm 23. God is saying, you you may not be able to see it, You may not recognize it. I know it's hard and the valley is dark, but I am with you. I am present in the valley with you, guarding and keeping and pursuing and restoring and renewing and nourishing throughout all of it. I am chasing you, pursuing you in love, keeping you from wandering away, and I'm going to lead you out of this dark mess and into my glorious presence forever. Friends, this is the hope of our journey Our journey has an end, and an end that is glorious. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because our good shepherd provides, protects, and pursues. Let's pray. Father, we lift up our voices to you and ask, knowing that there are some here who may never have trusted in you as their shepherd. Perhaps they're tired of being their own shepherd. They see how they've wandered into ravines and into ditches and have gotten into all sorts of trouble and they they can't get themselves out. I pray that they would see with eyes of faith this morning how you are holding out your son, Jesus Christ, to be their good shepherd. 
that they would lay hold of him by faith today. They could say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I pray that you would cause them to do that this morning. Open their eyes. We pray for those who have trusted in you as our shepherd, that you would help us to see all the ways that you have abundantly provided for us, materially, physically, and spiritually, that we would be freshly astounded by the reality that the sovereign Lord of the universe is our shepherd. Comfort us, encourage us, give us confidence in the reality that you are with us in the valley. As dark as the valley may be, as fearful as it may be, encourage us with the truth that you are with us, leading, guiding, pursuing. Nourish us today with these realities and help us as we stand in the midst of the darkness to fix our eyes on your glorious presence and the light that is coming. Keep us, pursue us into your house and into your home forever. And we pray this all in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen.